In the late 50s, uh, the Russians put a satellite into the air uh, and uh, drove Americans crazy because they got to jump on us. And so the government put a whole bunch of money into something called the National Defense Education Act. And the National Defense Education Act uh, provided money for universities in a whole bunch of fields, including, for some reason, English. And I got hired under NDA money. I'm Bill Cadbury, and I came to the University of Oregon as an instructor in the year 1961, and uh, I taught in the English department for, uh, oh goodness, how many years? Uh, well, I don't know, until about 1977, thereabouts, at which point we created a film studies area in the speech department. And I taught in the speech department then f till 1992 when I, quote, retired. So exactly 50 years ago this year, I started teaching here. And two years before I got here was the first time that they allowed uh, modern literature to count for an English department uh, major credit. You know, anything before, after the 19th century w was considered, oh, the sort of thing that people do uh, on their own. You don't study that. So film, just, I mean, film was just unthinkable. But, but nonetheless, it was in the culture as, as a whole, it was a, a very great uh, enthusiastic part of, of uh, intellectual culture, film was, in, those, in the 1960s. And so I started uh, some, some classes in what was at that time called the Free University. The Free University was alternative classes that, were, that sprung up around campus in various, various th things. And uh, a student, an undergraduate student of mine named, named Linda Blackaby, who's, who's a, a, to this day a, a film person, she runs the San Francisco uh, Film Festival, and she said, why don't you teach a class in the Film University, in the Free University on film? So down in the, chi in the Shere Khan Chicken Factory, we had some space, and so I started teaching a, a film class that for, for the Free University, and, and uh, that went on for a little bit, and, and then said, look, this shouldn't just be in this, quote, Free University, this should also be in the, in, in the university itself. So I went to my department chairman and said, can I teach a course in, in film? And let me teach, start teaching a class in film as literature. Which in, uh, as an English class, and uh, did that as a, as a standalone course, and did it over and over and over again, and, and uh, eventually kind of turned it into a program. And here's how. This is, uh, I think, the, probably the most important day of my academic life was the day when I went to the f university faculty meeting and, and made the argument, people resisted it, but made the argument that that course, Film as Literature, should be repeatable for credit. And, and students could take a whole series of them for credit and count it towards the English major, which was, had more, a little bit more freedom in terms of what people could count for credit, and essentially build a film program that way. Take five or six of those classes, you'd have a whole bunch, whole bunch of directors under your belt. You know? And I kept alive because I was able to do new things all the time uh, and, and, uh, and got a, a bunch of students who were interested in what was going. And that was really how, how that program in a sort of a subterranean program in the English department got, got, de got developed like that. So the way films got exhibited and studied was in renting 16 millimeter films from outside. And by the time that I was starting to repeat films, uh, it became clear that that, that, that uh, uh, it shouldn't have to rent in uh, films every single time. It would be a good idea to own some. You know those original films in the in what what you're thinking of as the collection, they were uh, uh, they were m mostly for that purpose. I, I had that sense at the time that in all these classrooms across campus, films were being shown and people and, and important filmmakers were present on campus campus talking about those films. Uh, I don't think that was actually true, but it, it seemed like at the time. I am Leslie Larson. I'm the Image Services Coordinator in the Knight Library. Uh, in a past life, I was a doctoral student in the English department uh, at a time when film, uh, film history courses were being taught. And I was a GTF for History of the Motion Picture, uh, which was a course that used 16 millimeter film as its sort of um, main means to show, show film. So I was sort of alive in the last days of um, uh, you know, film-based uh, teaching on okay. campus. The Cultural Forum um, had a series, I don't remember the title, sort of it was like Classics of World Cinema, but they would have a, a series each term. 
um, you know, it'd be like Polish films, Italian films, Hollywood classics. Uh, those were shown at the PLC, and those were all shown for the most part on film, 16 millimeter. You know, you actually had to pay admission to get in, uh, and uh, there was definitely a, a kind of fan base, or you know, a, an enthusiasm for. Um, you know, seeing those films, as, and so uh, I would just say they were well attended. You know, it was it was normalized. It wasn't like this fetishized thing, like oh, we're going to watch a film on film. It's just that film was how the the, the the films themselves were projected. There's a new emphasis on the, the the paying attention to the format itself of film because when I was a student, that was that I wouldn't say it was a novelty, but it was less of a point of emphasis. Like it was just one more way in which we watch movies. And I, and I will say, I think the viewing experience of watching a, a, a film on film is, is much more intense and rewarding than watching on DVD. You always kind of felt like you were watching a generation removed from the original. Um, I think for, for your generation now, there is that sort of nostalgia of sort of going back and kind of longing for that viewing experience that, that you're not quite getting in in watching something on DVD. I think there's this really interesting and kind of charming or bewitching relationship between the content of a lot of these 16 millimeter films and the actual medium. That they're these kind of these cans and I sort of liken them to a lens lamp. You sort of open them up and they're these surprises. There's just something utterly rich and strange about putting these films and then watching them with this very small select group of people. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for the format itself, but also this whole other world of, wow, what happens to films afterward, and thinking about issues of copyright and ownership, and how unfortunate it is that some of these things are locked away. My name is Elizabeth Peterson, and I am the subject specialist for literature in English and cinema studies in Knight Library. And uh, my relationship to the 16 millimeter collection has sort of evolved over the last five years. Um, I didn't, wasn't even aware really that it existed until an email went around suggesting that we should get rid of it. So I started uh, doing an inventory project, going one film at a time, researching how it was made, um, its significance basically, is it Oregon related? Is it in the public domain? Four years later, I got through 129 films out of almost 800. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I had a team of willing students to help me do this? I could make a lot more progress. And I could teach them some stuff along the way. So that's how the class took shape. And I did the math, if I could have 15 students, have them each do 10 or 12 films apiece, that's a lot of progress. It was a challenge to pull together the equipment that we need to assess the films. So we have one film winder that works in the library. And then we also have something called a projecto editor, which is even more magical because you can run the film through a light box and actually see what's on the film without the commitment of running through it a whole projector or the trauma of running through a projector. But we have two of those and in the entire library and one of them is dedicated to special collections and they use it enough that we can't really borrow it consistently. So for students to be able to assess their films, we don't have the equipment. On top of that, we don't have a room where we could set this stuff up and students could come outside of class to work on the projects, so it requires in-class time to do it. And we don't have a regular screening room. We don't have a place where students can go on weekends or at night to screen films. And these films are often only available on this format, so it's not like they can go and watch it on YouTube or get a DVD. And it requires students to be able to learn how to run a projector, and the projectors have to work. And um, <laughs> and we only have two reliable ones right now. So we've been working around those things, but they've definitely been challenges. And I think I got really lucky with this group of students because they all kind of stumbled their way toward it in different ways, um, some of whom didn't really know what they were signing up for, but discovered that they really liked the subject matter. The feedback that I've gotten from the students uh, along the way is just this 
this like revelatory experience of handling actual film and understanding the the chemical process that went into putting the image on the the acetate itself and then understanding how it can degrade over time and why that affects what we see and hear on the screen. In Cinema Studies or School of Journalism, you're learning about how to make film and you're learning how to analyze film and you're learning about the history of film. And this takes us to the other end of it, which is what happens to film after it's made. Not just how we watch it, because you certainly study exhibition, but this is another aspect of exhibition that's different from I mean, watching things in a classroom or films that were intended for a classroom viewing as opposed to a, a movie palace. That's something different, but then also what happens to the physical elements of film over its lifespan? And what are the, some of the possibilities for trying to um, arrest deterioration, make things accessible for researchers or for film fans via digital access or simply making our collections more visible and known to potential users? Well, within the world of special collections university archives, it's been a, a debate that's been going on for a hundred or more years. It probably goes back to the Greek and Roman libraries, really, about access and preservation. I mean, on the one hand, uh, you want to put materials in people's hands because it's about use. What's the point of having things if they're not being used? On the other hand, this is the extreme, you also know that as you use things, you use them up so that they will be destroyed over time. And the more fragile the media is, um, the more likely it is to be destroyed. What you try to do is find a balance in between there so that you can be welcoming and have the stuff accessible and be used, but at the same time that it's not being used up, that it's being preserved, that people are cautious. I mean, we have the sense a lot of people don't think about exactly how film was put together with this base, a plas plastic base and an emulsion layer. And it's not good enough to take your home movies to uh, your local film center or whoever it is and have it transferred over to a DVD or whatever and then throw the original away. That's really not what we want to do. You want to save the original too. So it's a, it's a huge problem. It, just like it's a, it, the preservation of information in our society is a huge problem. The digital media, tremendously fragile. People don't think about that, but the shelf life of like DVDs and CDs is 10 years. Then I think also too, the other issue you deal with is, is awareness on your own, in your own institution. So all the way up the chain that higher level administrators understand that this is important material. This is important as the new books that are being published or the new databases that are coming out that the library needs to preserve the resources and also acquire new ones. I mean, we all, bear responsibility, all of us bear responsibility to making sure that these artifacts, that these documents are there for the next generation.